So I think increasingly as this technology advances, there will be industrial applications as well as uh, consumer applications that will essentially enable a conversational robot. Uh, it still might be text, it might be on your phone, it might be like a chat window, or it might be speech interface, or it might be a virtual a digital human on your screen, or it might actually one day be a full robot. But whatever it is, because it's really gained some mastery of the human language, it's able to converse with us, have a dialogue with us. It feels um, that, like the dialogue is, uh, is reasonable and it helps us um, get, get our, our job done. We can ask it questions. So this will really elevate the capabilities of intelligence when AI starts to master language. I should also clarify that uh, the fact that it appears to have a mastery of language doesn't mean that it fully understands. It's merely able to very intelligently map what you said against a gigantic repository of what it knows. It doesn't really um, understand language the way that we do, uh, the way that uh, we can have emotion, emotive responses and uh, create connection between people and, and draw uh, very uh, vague analogies and truly understand every type of humor. It's not quite that, but for uh, kind of business interactions or personal agent kinds of things, I imagine there would be uh, very close to having a very smart personal assistants that are perhaps like your secretary or your uh, junior uh, entry level analysts in the work that you do, the, the people that could find answers for you uh, and solve problems for you uh, without extreme business complexity that I imagine that AI will be able to do that in the 20 year time frame. The second key point I want to predict is in the uh, transportation area. We all talk about a lot autonomous vehicles. So when will they come about? So my prediction is that uh, L5 capability that is fully autonomous, no steering wheels in the car, can go anywhere to anywhere, that capability of driving is probably about 20 years away. But that doesn't mean we, we have to wait that long to be sitting in, in an autonomous vehicle. In fact, <clears throat> we can sit in one right now lower left-hand side shows you a robo minibus. <clears throat> and that one is in deployment today um, you know, on special routes, but next year it will be in full deployment in three cities in China. And, and the key thing to re recognize is while to a human driving a bus seems like a challenging task, maybe even more than driving a car because it's bigger, but to an AI, Driving a bus is so much easier because buses drive on fixed routes, typically in uh, in in large in in large well-paved roads, um, and you can also choose cities that have decent weather. Um, and it doesn't have to do with edge cases like uh, a uh, baby crawling across the street. What do you do? Is it a baby or is it a puppy? Can you tell? Well, because AI learns from data and, and no autonomous vehicle has data with baby versus, versus puppies crossing the road. So how is it ever going to learn that? <clears throat> so doing uh, buses and in fact, before that, doing highways is a very good way to collect data, gain practice, and then the data makes the system better and so on. Uh, and also uh, the robo bus doesn't have to deal with very tiny roads, uh, windy roads in, you know, in, in the mountains. It doesn't have to deal with uh, what happens if there's a natural disaster that causes a uh, small road in the countryside to um, <clears throat> not be able to uh, see the street signs or maybe the pavement has uh, uh, been broken due to an earthquake. So what about all these cases? Well, if you're in big cities and you're operating in large paved roads, uh, and you're driving fixed routes to maybe just 50 places, 50 fixed stops, then that is much easier. So the phase one, maybe the next 10 years, will be uh, increasingly more difficult 
environments in which autonomous vehicle, vehicle is applied uh, all the time, gaining data and improving itself and getting uploads. Uh, if you've seen uh, some reports on the Tesla uh, summoning feature, you would know that when Tesla first launched this feature, uh, it, it's just the capability of uh, having your parked car find you. Uh, it's very clever, but when they first launched it, it didn't work out all that well. But as they accumulated more and more data, it began to work extremely well. So that shows how powerful that data collection and then the auto update that Tesla sent out to be very, very critical. So that's kind of phase one, the next 10 years. And then after that 10 years, getting to uh, getting into work on robo taxis, getting people comfortable with passing laws, ensuring the casualties are not are, are better than today um, can take a long time. That's why I estimated maybe 20 years, maybe even longer. One thing that can make it faster is smart cities and smart highways. Imagine if the road starts communicating with the car that says uh, you're swerving off the road, be careful. Um, then the car can self-correct. Or maybe the road can say, the transmission on the road can tell the car, there's an accident up ahead. You can't see it, but be, slow down, be careful. So, so, so essentially we're turning the current signs on the street from those telling people, drive, human drivers, what's happening or what to do to signals that tell the cars what's happening, what to do. And when you turn signals native in the car's language, it can, of course, appreciate it better than reading human signs. Uh, furthermore, cars will be able to talk to each other. One car could say, oh, I just blew a tire, so be careful around me. That could be saving lives just by that broadcast. And one car can tell another uh, where I'm in a hurry. Uh, the person in my car needs to get to where he needs to get to in a hurry. Please get out of my way. Ten cents. And then the other car might say, no, I want a dollar. Then they negotiate and then um, they give the right of way. So that could happen as well. And, and also um, <clears throat> cars uh, will, will be able to negotiate their exact path so that they barely miss each other by one, one centimeter. And humans won't be able to do that. So in 20 plus years, humans will slowly uh, feel that uh, we are unsafe to ourselves. The biggest danger to ourselves is not the autonomous vehicle, but our poor ability to drive. And then eventually people won't be allowed to drive on highways and perhaps all the roads. That will be beyond 20 years, but it's coming. Um, once we are able to deliver very capable autonomous vehicles, that can be the next operating system after Windows and Android, because you can use that same capability, the multi-sensor fusion, the uh, AI deep learning capabilities, the real-time processing, uh, integrating knowledge of everything in your environment, recognizing who's moving, what's moving, those very capabilities that make autonomous vehicles work are the same things we need for robotics. So great robots will come after that as well. And we've all heard about you know, using space travel to go up in space and then come down as a faster way to go from say, uh, London to, to Tokyo. The third area is a big one. It is probably the area that will make the biggest difference applying AI to healthcare. Uh, the reason is quite simple. It is the fact that healthcare is in the process of digitizing and AI feeds on data and healthcare is now digitizing everything. Healthcare records, um, radiology, pathology, data from our wearables and uh, data from multiomics, genetic, genetic sequencing and the like, blood tests, all of that are incredibly valuable data. That's basically the same as when I gave you the example of uh, all the data about my income and house and so on, on whether I deserve a loan. This is data to determine whether you're ill or how to uh, become healthier. So all this data collected for people longitudinally over years, if not decades, can be tremendous, not only in improving the quality of diagnosis and treatment, Imagine now individualized treatments. Uh, we've all, we're all used to everyone getting sick, getting the same treatment. 
And if a drug doesn't work, maybe we try another, maybe there's a second defense. Um, but now that we can collect all this data, we can determine maybe for some illnesses, different people with different history may be more efficaciously treated with different types of treatments. So uh, this is called precision medicine, gives different treatment to people, really leveraging the big data and the individuality of treatment of uh, healthcare. And beyond diagnosis and treatment, monitoring, long-term care, prevention are all great ways to use this data. And once this is done, we can see applications everywhere from imaging, drug discovery, uh, to many, many applications. I'll mention four quickly now. One is, uh, I'll just pick, start from the upper right, in pathology. Uh, people uh, really are not the ideal uh, species to do pathology because we can't see all the images very clearly. We can't integrate all the knowledge. We can't combine, compare with all the people. And in fact, in certain types of diagnosis, AI is already beating humans, for example, in um, sicknesses related to the eye. And this will just continue um, and, and, and improve. Um, a second area on the upper left is AI drug discovery. This is using, uh, for example, DeepMind's protein folding uh, to do the protein folding to begin with, followed by, for example, using AI to help find a target on which to at uh, attach a molecule, uh, which is the drug, and then to discover which molecule is most likely to work. Uh, one of the companies we invested in called In Silico Medicine has actually used this approach with human supervision, but AI discovery to discover drugs for two illnesses. Uh, one is um, pulmonary, fibrosis, and the other is kidney fibrosis, both almost untreatable, now becoming treatable. And the most exciting thing is uh, what AI is doing is not smarter than people. It's just helping to reduce the uh, scope and the size and, and help make discovery faster because it eliminates uh, unlikely uh, candidates and lets the human scientists hone in on the right drug faster. So the real outcome is that the uh, human scientist's productivity increases and is able to in, perhaps discover a drug uh, three to four times faster and maybe 10 times cheaper. And what this means is that currently pharmaceuticals are not willing to invest in, uh, in drugs for rare diseases because it could cost $2 billion to, for such a drug discovery. And, and because it's a rare disease, it won't pay for its R&D. But if we are able to reduce the cost by a factor of 10 by using AI tools to help the scientists, we can now go after rare diseases and that will help us be, live healthily as well. On the lower left is autonomous uh, robots. We all know about a company called Intuitive Surgery, Surgical, sorry, in, Intuitive Surgical. It is currently still uh, operated by a doctor remotely and, and does certain types of surgery. In the future, as robotics become finer and finer in motor skills and um, accuracy and autonomy, it will gradually move from human operated to human delegate to parts of it to let AI operate. As an example, um, you might argue the surgery itself is too important, the, surg the surgeon should do that. But what about suturing? right? Sewing the per patient up, that is almost like a sewing machine. Um, probably the robot can do a better job. So why not delegate parts of the surgery uh, to robots? And then that will reduce the stress and workload on the surgeon, allowing the surgeon to treat more patients. That's a great thing. And then eventually uh, some surgeries will be um, potentially performed uh, fully by robots under surgeon's care and direction. And that probably is around the 20 year uh, time frame, uh, assuming the various laws uh, support that. So these are some of the exciting ideas. One of the more recent ideas I want to briefly mention is can AI help us live longer and health healthier? And I'm personally uh, using a technology um, that um, is in a company we invest in called uh, Deep Longevity that takes, in fact, all of our data, multi-omics, blood, and, um, um, 
and radiology data to identify the attributes of aging and, and tell us what we should do to slow down the aging or in some cases even reverse the aging effect. And um, the advice it gives can be uh, related to your diet, it might be related to exercise or sleep, uh, or might be introducing some medicine and uh, nutrients. And of course, this is all supervised by a doctor who will tweak the recommendations. And I've been on this regimen for about a year and I am watching my blood become uh, healthier and healthier. In fact, it's about six years healthier than it was one year ago. So by some metric, I might be five years younger now. The fourth area is in robotics. Uh, I believe the advances in robotics are happening and it, in, in China is in particular driving it because China is the world's factory and has a strong incentive to lower the cost of producing goods because Chinese labor costs are going up compared to countries like India, uh, Vietnam, and Brazil. So in the area of um, uh, autonomous transport, moving things, uh, we, we, we are seeing for, forklifts to be the lowest hanging fruit, followed by moving things outside, followed by trucks, followed by buses, followed by cars, uh, all along collecting more data enabling the next more difficult scenario. We've kind of covered that under transportation. But in an industrial, it's something similar. We want to go after the low-hanging fruits. Uh, and in a factory, uh, the human uh, capability being used from simplest to hardest are using our eyes for visual inspection. Is the t-shirt proper size or not, proper color or not. Then moving things around. <clears throat> kind of like forklifts, but also in this example, you see a uh, watering robot in a um, farm. In the third case is a picker, something that can pick merchandise up. Imagine using it in Amazon's um, uh, warehouse. And then the fourth example is a fancy finger that can actually pick up very delicate objects, in this case, an egg yolk, and that could be applied to more cases of picking. And then the last case is autonomous flying with a drone. So all of these are enabling cases that will uh, potentially make uh, manufacturing, uh, the production process much more efficient, uh, replacing parts or all of human labor. And this will be further advanced as robots become self-replicating, self-maintaining, -maintain, uh, as 3D uh, printing uh, start to take off and also manufacturing can be extended to um, homes to be built in modules, can be extended to energy in terms of making battery and solar panels, can be extended to uh, materials as uh, new ways of producing goods that are uh, constructed by scientists one molecule at a time. So number